NS. Well, you lot seem to like the Dinebot style ripoff, so why even keep it subtle at this point? Now that the restrictions have been slightly lifted, train fares are happening again. And do you know what that means? RECKLESS SPENDING! A slight downside of this hobby simply is that it is a matter of how deep your pockets are when you're not that skilled of a modeler like myself. And at these fairs, due to mostly consisting out of people wanting to get rid of their old junk and a handful of professional vendors, usually fairs are a very effective way to find the stuff you're looking for on the cheap. There is one slight problem, if one could call it that, with the average Dutch model railway enthusiast. They don't particularly like British stuff, nor do they like Dutch stuff for that matter. Do you know what they do like? Germany. No matter where you go in this country, chances are that if there's a model railway display or an exhibition, it will be inspired by the German landscape and it has German locomotives running on it. And I don't get why? It's not as if there's no NS models out there, there's plenty! From the Roco NS1000 to the very latest Pico Trax locos. But, oh well, I like British stuff so I would always be in the minority there. That being said, I was kind of on a bargain hunt for an NS loco that I could possibly convert to a hardwired DCC loco if it wasn't already built with an interface. The way I go to these fairs is that I walk around the whole building first, taking a careful look at items I might be interested in, and then, when I've scanned everything, I go back to the items that I really wanted. Now, I didn't really have a budget this time, but in my head I knew when I've spent a hundred bucks or more, that's when I stop. Because again, I was bargain hunting. The first thing I bought was a pack of KDs. <laughs> Whew, the amount of stuff I've heard about KDs made my tension lock wire brain explode. I only bought the one pack just to test it out and the results were mixed in a good way. They couple so much better than tension locks, even in curves they just instantly connect. They're great for the close coupling of carriages, so your rake will look much better if you decide to use them throughout. However, when coupled to a locomotive, you might want to use a number 19, because these number 18s are just a little too short and will cause buffer lock when reversing, both in regular curves and over point work. Just for a giggle, I tried the KDs on the Hornby generic six-wheel coaches, because say what you want about them, but these coaches are glued to the track. But on these two, number 18s are just too close coupled to be practical. But the KDs function best on short wheel-based wagons, which would be the prime candidates for receiving better couplings anyway, in my opinion. They can do curves and points no problem. At least the numbers 18s do anyway. So if you want to replace the couplings on your wagons, number 18 is the one I'd recommend. But my absolute favorite thing about KDs is that you can do this. No need to twist the model around, no need to cause derailments when uncoupling, just a simple pick up and drop and for that reason alone I'd love to get more KDs when funds allow me to. And to that one guy, yes I've seen you in the comment section of my last model railway videos, don't worry. No, I don't use the ad revenue from this video to buy trains. Actually, I don't use the ad revenue from these videos at all. Because I refuse to put up ads on these videos and turn my hobby into just another source of revenue. No disrespect if you do, it's just not a practice I find myself being comfortable with. Getting back to those KDs, they were actually all I purchased right up to walking down that last stall I hadn't checked out yet. And let me tell you, that last table in that building is what did it for me. Before that I had already seen a few Lima double O gauge models, like a Pullman livery class 73 and a BR2 tone green Deltic, which are slightly too late for my preferred period. The Deltic may be, but the 73, I had to let it go. A shame really, because I actually really like the 73s and I was overjoyed when I found out that I had an excuse to run them in a scotch setting. But I rock up to that last stall and my eyes feast on this. Get out of here. Backman's 32-250X. Or, in other words... <laughs> Woo! Yeah! <laughs> the meme is alive! Profile picture and collection are one at last! I've wanted an NS livery WD ever since I learned that Backman did that. And, okay, it's not quite the, the 210 version or NS5000 for those of you that have been paying attention. But... 
Man, am I glad I found this. <laughs> it even has the wee top hat. The vendor asked 90 euros for this, which for an NS steam locomotive is a steal. For reference, that's what, £76.55? And like, sure, she's second hand, but that's a price I would gladly pay. I've certainly paid more for brand new locos that didn't function. Come on, get out of here. I did some research on this beauty after I bought this. Turns out she's one of a batch of 500, made as a limited edition model for Tasco, Nederland. I have no idea what that is, but the first result on Google was an oriental wholesale store, but I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest that is the wrong Tasco. It's even one of the Aussies built by the North British Locomotive Company of Glasgow, distinguishable by the diamond-shaped builder's plate. As you can see, I put my own crushed coal in, and I do that with any model that allows it. Yes, I am that guy. Where did I... Where is it? Hello. This is off script. I lost it. Where did it go? I lost the coal. I lost it. I put it, th I put it here, but now it's not there. Where, where did it go? I genuinely had a joke there about the coal not looking like real coal, but um, I lost the coal piece, so... Uh, <laughs> whoopsie! The lamps and stovepipe chimney and ladder on the fireman's side don't come as standard, so the previous owner must have attached those. The lamps were a bit on the wonk when I bought it, but uh, it was easily fixed, just a dab of glue and she's fine. Revel, my beloved. I did clean the model with water and a cotton bud because she was absolutely filthy. The amount of hairs I had to remove from the handrails does not bear thinking about, trust me. I didn't fit any crew yet though, as the ones I have, these uh, Noch figures, don't quite look right, and the Hornby ones, the ones made from black plastic, also don't quite do the job for me, even with a paint job. She's fitted with these horrible EU couplings that everyone seems to use nowadays, even 009 manufacturers. They are literally worse than tension locks, why don't we use Fleissmann's old system? The couplings are permanently fitted, by the way, the front one can be screwed loose and the NEM socket is gone, but the one on the back is glued into the NEM socket. Thank you, autofocus. The model is not DCC fitted as standard, but rest assured, she's my number one priority to hardwire when I get around to doing it, because this actually isn't a split chassis model. But you're not here for her looks alone, you're here to see her perform. So let's walk over to the layout and get her going, shall we? Oh, and isn't she a stunner? That yellow lining really makes all the difference, doesn't it? I have to confess and say that I don't have a modern controller, it's these crusty Fleissman lads for me. So, whilst they don't allow most models to do a good crawl, the speeds this model can maintain are more than reasonable for a freight loco. She does stop on the dead zone right here, which seems to be a trademark Backman feature where their locos just completely stop even if there are plenty of wheels outside of the dead zone. But unlike the J72, the Aussie is forgiven because it is a freight loco that will most likely be running along at speed slightly higher than a shunter would. She also seems to be running slightly better in reverse, but the difference is minimal. When I hold her back you can see that this loco does not have a torque issue, which does hint at a good motor. I fitted this Warwell with a coupling that's compatible with this abomination of a coupling system, and she can haul it without significant slowdown, as again, the model should be a great hauler. Running in this direction she runs mostly fine, save for this one curve where the locomotive suddenly seems to stop while her wheels are still turning. This is because I don't actually run on a proper baseboard, much to my annoyance. I run on four simple IKEA tables bolted together and the tabletops actually bow quite significantly, causing the WD's wheels to temporarily lose contact with the track. There's also a possible second reason as to why this happens, but I'll get into that later. This only really is a slight problem on curves as on a straight, like this non-scenic section of the board, she doesn't slow down at all. Also when she travels light, it's barely an issue. The valve gear on this side of the model is actually much more free to move. This isn't because this side is not fitted properly, it's because the other side is significantly stiffer. I think this model was dropped at some point because on the other side the expansion link is bent out of shape and the steam pipe isn't connected to the smoke box. There's actually a reason why this locomotive is running in this direction, as when she runs in the other direction, 
the pony derails on curves with out fail I've tried everything in my power to fix that. I tightened the screw so the pony would hover over the track. It doesn't work. I tried fitting the screw as loose as possible so it would lay on the track like a brick, but that didn't help either. She's also hopeless over points. After a bit of investigating, I figured out what was most likely causing the problem. These steps do not come as fitted from the factory, and usually they're included in the detail bag. When a model goes around the curve, the steps act as a brake shoe and actually stop the wheel from turning, but they also stop the pony truck from swiveling all the way left or right. But, and I think I'm not alone in this, I don't like prying off details of my models, even if they don't come as standard from the factory. I know it might be the only thing between this model and running properly, but I don't want to risk breaking it only to find out it didn't impact the running that greatly after all. But for what she is, and for what I paid, most of all, I think she's grand. I just happened to find a limited edition NS locomotive built in Scotland, no less, that's almost the same as my profile picture. Like, <laughs> I'm actually chuffed with this. <laughs> but that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for watching, and since this is the first time I can address it in a video, huge thanks for helping the channel get past 12,000 subscribers. The Hornby video must have been the sole reason that I breached the 10,000 bracket to begin with, so my biggest takeaway from this is that people want to see more Model Railway content. Whoa, that voice crack. Would you like to see me look at another budget NS model? Which one would you recommend? And what about this lovely lady? Uh, should I take off the steps? And how would I go about it without breaking it? Do you have any ideas? I'd love to hear them. So again, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye. Yes, I saw that Steam Sound Supreme is doing a big jeep. Yes, I will be making a video about it. But yeah, if you have tips on improving the running of the WD that I have, uh, please let me know.